potentially. Pull. Here he comes. Paul, where are you, Paul? I'm waiting on you. I see that I've invited you. You can do this. Where'd you go, Paul? You're there. Connecting. Boom. <laughs> there he is. Magic. Morning, sunshine. <laughs> Good morning. How's it going? It's going all right. How are you? Good, good. I know it's a, it's a little bit early. You've got your coffee going. I've got uh, coffee. Thanks for getting up and Adam. Um, yeah. It certainly is a little different daily schedule, isn't it, Paul? It is. It, yeah, it is. It's managing uh, working from home and uh, managing the kids. And uh, yeah, their expectations are if I'm home, I'm uh, focused 100% on them. <laughs> Yes, yes, I remember those days. I remember those days. They're good days, but they're not that easy a day. It's fun stuff. Look, I mean, you can see the Arizona sunshine behind me. It could be a lot worse right now. Sure, you know, and, and there are, I know, um, in, in a lot of big cities all over the world, there are people having a hard time, and uh, they're not able to get out, and they don't really even have sunshine, and so... Um, I'm uh, certainly thinking of them, and, and uh, it's unprecedented, isn't it? Yeah, no, it, it really is, so at least in, in my lifetime. Uh, so, But, you know, if you're going to be under house arrest somewhere, this is, this is pretty good. Yes. You'd think I'd have a, some sort of potting green out here or something. <laughs> <laughs> I would think you would have a ping man out there just firing shots across, <laughs> across the neighbor's yard. You know, I've got a whole bunch of engineers working from home. Maybe that can be our project. They Everyone hit from, from home. You, you hit shots from your place to Eric's place. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul, you know, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we really appreciate it. I know a lot of uh, coaches, a lot of golfers are tuning in. And um, this really has, certainly speaking selfishly, it's been a good respite for me uh, to get away from just being bored and sitting around thinking about what I should be doing and what I'm not doing. Uh, so this has been great and thank you so much for participating. I wanted to firstly congratulate you and the whole engineering team at Ping on, I know something that isn't really that mainstream, but I know to you guys it really means a lot and that's the My Golf Spy 2020 Best Driver article, awards, whatever you want to call it. Um, you guys pretty much cleaned up. Can you tell us a little about it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, I think of all the tests out there, my golf spy probably do the best job of trying to trying to really do a genuine data-centric player test with 30 different drivers, which I remember when they first started doing it, they, they asked a whole bunch of people for advice, and they asked me, you know, how would, how would you set up a player test with 30 different clubs and I said I'd narrow it down to three clubs to start with I yeah. mean it's an ambitious project to try to get the same players hitting that many drivers and, and you get lost in data but uh, but they do a really nice job of, of the best you can of comparing all the different things out there and, and yeah I saw, that, I saw that this year in the test they hit over 15,000 shots yeah, it's a lot. I mean, the, the commitment, I haven't met any of the people that do the testing for them, but they must be uh, really committed golfers. <laughs> it's that's a lot, a, that's that's a lot a, of shots to hit. Um, but it's what you have to do if you want to have players hit all the, you can't have them hit three shots with each club. You're not going to get any data worth its salt. So, um, you know, so fair play to them for, for doing that. Um, I mean, and I know other you know, other magazines like the the hot list testing is an awful lot of shots, and they're not the only ones. But um, but I think you know we know the my golf spy guys pretty well, and they they really try to do the right thing, and try to do the best they yeah. can. You know, we respect that. And sometimes sometimes we win, and sometimes we don't, and that's fine. You know, um, but uh, but it's nice. You know, this is a great year for us because we had the LST driver was the number one strokes gained, and then the plus driver. Um, was the number two on their test, and yeah, then that's even the SF Tech, which is really kind of 
for a specific type of player, that got a special mention as being the best driver for the, the anti-slice um, kind of yeah. technology. So just good validation. You know, it's one it's one data point. It's, you don't want to get too excited about it, but it's it's good validation that what we're doing is working for real golfers. You know, I couldn't agree day, more. I couldn't reason. agree more. It's uh, I know I know the my golf spy guys, and and I read some of the comments they get. Um, on their social media platforms and that, and I just know that I couldn't do their job because everybody is an expert um, when it comes to, oh, well, you know, I hit these two drivers five times each and this one's clearly better. Um, <laughs> it, it, that, that just doesn't work when it comes to true research and proper testing, and they have to deal with literally thousands of experts, um, and they really do, as a result, go out of their way to to make it unbiased and to do it scientifically, to do it really, truly properly. Um, so that's really good to see. Uh, and I know, you know, having seen the results from, I think one website claimed the G400 LST to be the greatest driver ever made for it. And I don't want this to be a, a, a pitch for Ping uh, in a roundabout way. Certainly you're with Ping, I'm with Ping. Um, it's going to ultimately be. Uh, but let's just talk about, you know, the technology. I, the G400, LST, and the regular G400 were both amazing drivers. Um, and you guys had to go to the drawing boards and say, okay, we got to do better than that. I would love to see the next one coming out, okay? But you got yeah. to do better than that. And so um, I've got, uh, I've got the, the plus head. That's what I use. I, I'm not a, I'm a low spin driver guy already. I got the LST right here. You got the LST. I okay. definitely need an LST head. So, uh, uh, I need I need help in the spin department, and so um, I, I don't need the LST. Uh, but what can you tell us, Paul, um, went into it? I, I know you've got a good story. Um, you and Eric have shared the story about um, the club face, and it wasn't necessarily on this model. It was when you went from the G30 to, was it? What, what was uh, it? Yeah, I'd say it was, yeah, G30 to G, and actually we just brought it in on the LS Tech model, and then now okay. we've kind of brought it in across the across the board. So, yeah, I mean, there's, oh, God, goodness, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into a driver, probably more than any other club. There's, there's a lot of technology aimed at anything we can do to help the ball go longer and straighter, right? One way or another, it has to come back to, does it make the, does it make the ball go uh, further, closer to the hole? Um, mm. And, um, you know, and, and it's a good insight. You mentioned G400 LST was was a little bit of a unicorn. It did so well for us, particularly with the better player. And, like, <laughs> Ping's, our, our core is, you know, our, our CEO, John Solheim, who's the son of Carsten Solheim, and he's been at the company since 1959. His one big rule is unless it's better, we don't launch it. And so we have to prove that. to him that any club we make is better than the last one. The benchmark's always ourselves. It's never competitive stuff. It's if we can keep making the clubs better each year, then then that's okay, and we'll, we'll get our fair share. And and there's an all there's a whole bunch of stuff that you know on paper how you think a club should perform. You know, we work on these technologies. Like I think everyone's pretty familiar now with the the turbulators on top, and that's something that both Eric and I worked on this whole project on aerodynamics and does aerodynamics really matter on a driver and combining simulation with real testing all that kind of stuff and coming to the conclusion yeah it does matter and one way to solve it is just to make a little teeny tiny driver but that wouldn't help anyone it'd be really aerodynamic but it would suck at everything else yeah so the, the innovation is can you do something that makes it better without making everything else worse so the turbulators make aerodynamics better but without compromising forgiveness and ball speed and all those other things so that's why we were excited about it um what do if i may ask paul uh, let's say someone makes a, a, a club a swing at 100 miles an hour what do the turbulators bring to the table they by themselves the turbulators are about really truly about a mile to a mile and a half uh, one, one to one and a half miles an hour wow that's that, that's amazing you know, it's enough to notice. Um, yeah. it, by itself, it's not going to be you know, 15 yards. But yeah. our philosophy is uh, we call it incremental gains. But if you add up a whole bunch of different things, that each yeah. one might be two yards here and a yard there, and 10% more forgiveness here and there, then 
you add up a bunch of them, then it adds up to something like this. Yeah. Um, and that, but where I was going with the 400 hours tech is sometimes the sum of it actually ends up being what we think is even greater than the parts. Like we kind of mm -hmm. on paper work out, this is how we think this club's going to perform. And then you get something that even surprises us. And so part of our job designing the G410 LS tech was we don't, if we're truly honest, we didn't completely understand everything about what made the 400 as successful as it was. So we had to get in there and figure out what little bits were we missing because we made our G410 prototypes and they were like pretty good, but not quite as good as 400 LS tech initially. And John Solheim says, well, you can't launch that. We can't have new ping driver nearly as good as the last. Um, so, I mean, this, the 400 LS tech took us a bit longer to get to market because it took some more work to figure out. Um, and the devil is in some of the details of the manufacturing. The devil is in, you know, this club by itself has the cast piece is made of one alloy of titanium. The face is made of another alloy of titanium. You've got right in here, you've got plastic and aluminium in there. You've got tungsten in the back. So there's a whole bunch of different pieces getting welded mm. together and all this at super tight kind of aerospace tolerances. I and mean, that's part of the detail of what makes it so good is this crown is two and a half um, dollar bills thick. Wow. If you think about that, you don't see it because you only see the outside. But yeah. And, and some of the sections are thinner than others. And so yeah. there's an awful lot that goes into these tiny, you know, two or three thousandths of an inch here and there tolerances. Yeah. And it's just trying to, some of it's being a bit of a Sherlock Holmes and figuring out, um, you know, where's the real key pieces in there. Yeah. It was a fun hey, Paul, project. Paul, can you tell me the story of, uh, about the face roughness? Um, yes. How you, guys, Sorry, yeah. how you guys? You guys were polishing up the face or something, weren't you? Yeah. So we. So I mean, the, the the quick version is we roughen up the face, and you would think it would give you more friction and more spin, but in actual terms, it actually brings the spin down, which is weird, right? I mean, yeah. counterintuitive to to anyone. I don't care who you are. The idea of let's make it rougher and the spin will go down just sounds like it couldn't be true. But it goes back to, I mean, years and years ago. I remember doing this um, experiment probably about 10 years ago. And we were trying to work on, like, how do we bring spin down on a driver without sacrifice? You can make the spin super low by just making the CG really low and really forward. But then there's the least uh, forgiving driver you could think of. So you want to make one that's forgiving and low spin together. Sure. That's hard. Yeah. And so I kind of thought at the time, well, how about we smooth up the face? We knew from just having fun on a Friday, that if you put chapstick on the face of the driver, you completely kill the spin. So if you yeah. get rid of friction totally, um, you, you basically get zero spin. So it's a fun game if you want to try it one day, get a bunch of chapstick, stick it on the face of your driver, and watch the thing just knock a ball. It's, it's kind of fun. So it shows you that if there's no friction at all, there's no spin. But it turns out it's way more complicated than just, well, the more friction, the more spin. So I tried to make some smooth face drivers that really polish them up nice. Okay, this is going to be fun. This is, it looks a little weird, but it's going to hardly spin at all. Put it on our robot and it spun like a thousand RPM more. And so you go, okay, well, we must have done the test wrong or something, right? Like do the test again. It must be wrong. Yeah. And it turns out it's repeatable. And at the time we were kind of like, I don't really understand why, but <laughs> a smooth face driver spins more. And then we got inspired by some work that the USGA had done. Um, golf equipment guy thanks the USGA for something. That doesn't happen too often. How about that? <laughs> um, but they started looking into some stuff. And, and, and there was just this like very throwaway comment about a model that they were looking at. And we kind of dug into it. And Eric and I, mostly Eric, if I'm honest, recreated this model and started to look at the implications of it. And then we looked at some work from a... Australian physicist who uh, has done all sorts of stuff on sport and, and how balls react and bounce and things. And anyway, it turns out that friction physics is really interesting when it comes to sports equipment. And the reason is because a golf ball squishes. And so if the golf ball didn't squish and the golf ball was just a kind of more idealized sphere that, that doesn't squish and doesn't kind of have compliance, then this wouldn't be, this would be a non-issue. But you get some fun stuff because the golf ball squishes during impact and then, you know, unsquishes the mm. highly technical way of putting it. And, and so when you start to look at the physics of what's going on, you can have a higher friction coefficient 
for less spin because you can basically get you can get grip, which would be kind of the ball like really is what is what it says gripping the face, or you can get slide where the ball kind of slides right up. So if you think about a wedge on a wet day when you really open up the face, it feels like the club just slides right under the ball. Yeah. Because that's what's happening. The ball is just sliding right off the face and, and never grips. Or you can get, during the impact, you can get a little bit of slide and then a bit of grip. And so the quirk of it all, the key to why a driver face spins less when it's rough is it just so happens the ball's on the face long enough that if it grips straight away, for the whole impact, during the second half of the impact, it actually starts to like vibrate back the other way, it kind of vibrates and then vibrates back the other way. So the spin's going up, going up, going up during this grip phase, and then it starts to go the other way as the ball kind of vibrates away. Whereas if you get slide and then grip, it doesn't have time to do that, and it spins um, more. Oh, that's interesting. So the rough face where it spin, where it grips the whole way, spins less. A normal face spins more and then if you go totally extreme where it never grips at all like chapstick it spins less again so it's kind of wild and it it yeah. happens to be a property of, of this little guy that that slip and grip actually gives you uh the most amount of spin yeah and so on a wedge it's the opposite because a wedge if you if you're not careful you just get slipped the whole way so you don't get much you still get a little spin but you don't get much yeah. that's the flyer and what you want with a wedge is to get it to, it always slides a bit because it's such a, an angled impact. So what you want is to get it to grip as quick as possible. So the more friction you can throw at it with a wedge, the more spin you'll get. Okay. okay. So the same thing you do for a wedge does the opposite on a driver. Kind of fun. Huh? It's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's repeatable. Yeah. Um, which means it's real. Eh? It's a real thing. Um, Paul, the, the, the weight of this, have you guys found, I know um, the GLE line that you guys make is a little lighter. Um, yeah. Have you guys found pretty much an optimal weight across the board for golfers um, as it pertains to driver heads without giving too much away? Yeah, I mean, so the reality is there's not, the, the true reality is probably there's a, there probably would be a way to optimize the ideal weight for every individual mm -hmm. uh, in, in a practical sense it's kind of hard to do that so you sort of try to group things together and, and, and try to look at I, 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 oh, 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 no. I got excited with my hands um, I would call it cluster uh, clustering so if there's a million golfers out there you try to like put them in sort of buckets of okay these people this weight will work pretty well for and these people and so, you know, for the GLE, the ladies' product, we specifically look at those people, their biomechanics, their, you know, just the strength, the muscles, all that kind of stuff, and do some optimizations for them. Even within our 410 line, there's actually a slightly different swing weight for the LS Tech driver, for the regular driver, and then for the SF Tech, just to kind of, it's oh, not a difference, but part of it's optimizing overall weight, part of it's just, the swing weight can also help with how easy it is to square the club up. So as you go lighter, it actually gets easier to square the club up. So there's a lot, it's quite complicated. It's a complicated answer to a simple question. Like there's no yeah. one weight that works for everyone. And ideally it's a little bit part of the fitting, uh, but it can get quite complicated, but you're looking at optimizing swing speed, but then also optimizing, you know, heavier is good for more forgiveness, more energy transfer, but it's bad for swing speed. Right, simple example, if yeah. I make this 100 grams heavier, the moment of inertia and the forgiveness goes through the roof, but you're not going to be able to swing it. So yeah. your swing speed goes down. So it's kind of this delicate balance. But equally, if I make it super light, I can record the fastest swing speed you can want, but the ball speed might go down because there's no energy transfer. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere around 200 to 210 grams is kind of the sweet spot for most people. It's a little lighter for some. You know, obviously our kids' product is a little lighter, that kind of stuff. So. Sure, sure. But there's no real magic to it. Uh, you know, the shaft plays in there as well. We're doing a lot of research on... That's why we use kind of this high balance point kind of technology. The more we can take weight out of this part of the shaft, this is kind of wasted weight where you have to work to swing it. Mm. It's not really contributing to the business end of the impact. So in a perfect yes. world, if you just ask a physicist to design a golf shaft, you'd make one that's... Plenty stiff, but infinitely light. 
Okay. Like that's not we're not in that world, but all things being equal, if you can take some weight out of here, we can then add it back in the head and use it to contribute to impact. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Paul, can you talk to us a little bit about sweet spot? I know a lot of golfers say, well, you know, I really hit that on the sweet spot. And um, certainly, you know, the bigger these heads get, they're not going to get much bigger. Um, but the bigger they are, um, the more, how shall I say, movable the sweet spot becomes. And, and, and can you just all right, give us a clear understanding about sweet spot um, and uh, and perhaps it, it, at the end, just talk a little bit about the movable weights that we're seeing on all these drivers today and how much that actually will influence the sweet spot. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you my take. Sweet, sweet spot's one of those things that's not like a, if you ask a physicist, what's the sweet spot? They'll be like, there's no such thing. It's a myth, right? But yeah. um, I think it's a couple of different things together. So one is there was a point on the club where you sort of minimize any twisting and vibration that the player feels based on impact, where it feels the sweetest. So there was definitely a point on the club where for your swing, the, sweet, the speed you put in, the club path, all those things, there's a point on the face where when you hit that, you, it minimizes any feel you get. And I think every golfer's experienced that, right? That just, it feels pure. like butter. It felt, it feels like butter, it feels pure, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, you can somewhat mess with that a little bit by the sound of the play, and that can kind of get in the player's head, the sound too. But, but there is such thing as, you know, call it central percussion, or there's all sorts of physics terms you can use. But broadly speaking, a point where when you hit it, it just feels pure. That isn't necessarily the point on the club where you get the best results, right? There's also, I think some people kind of conflate sweet spot with, the point where the ball just seems to come out perfect, right? Like yeah, I just yeah. crushed it. Some of that's also sound that it just, you know when you got it right in the right spot. And so they might be slightly different spots, but broadly I think we're all talking about that point on the face where you just feel like everything was right, like nothing felt like it's twisting. Mm. The ball's going, you know, like a rocket, like for, for your I perception. Rem I remember that feel. I, I had one of those last year. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had one in about 1989, yeah. No, <laughs> and so the aim of the game is to try to make as many of your shots feel like that. So when we talk about increased sweet spot, I mean, the sweet spot is a spot no matter what you do. But if you kind of go, all right, everything that gets within a few percentage points of that, well, we'll call that the sweet zone. Well, now you can talk about increasing the sweet zone. So we, we would kind of define, all right, we do like a robot test where we map around the face. Right? So you hit the center you get your kind of ball speed, launch speed, and then you go, right, on the robot, you can do fun things like, like let's just move it a quarter inch here, a quarter inch there, yeah. and you kind of map the face. Well, so now you can start to quantify, okay, how does the ball speed change? How does the launch and spin change? When we've kept everything else the same, and, and our aim is to try to get the most similar results for your miss hits, because we all miss hit. Right. But when you get your kind of not quite perfect one, if you can still get that feeling of, no, that came out pure, then that's a sign that we're doing our job and your, you know, the forgiveness of the club, yeah. the flex of the face, everything is playing into giving you a more similar result. Because that's what we want, right? We want your miss hits to go almost as good as your best hits. So yeah. we can't quantify it as more, more of a sweet zone, you know, a sweet spot just kind of gets, even for me, it just gets me a little, that's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. sweet spot. But yeah. I, I get what people are saying. You have to call it something. Yeah. Um, and, and then as regards the way, yeah. you know, Part of the deal with the weight, right? Obviously, what you're doing with a weight, any movable weights, whether it's you know heel and toe, ours is a channel that you know you move the weight. The reason it's back here is because this is kind of where you want to put the weight. Like this is where it maximizes forgiveness. But as soon as I take it from the middle to the heel or toe, I've moved the center of mass of the club. I've moved the sweet spot a little bit to the heel or toe. And if you want to make a driver a little more fade biased, you put the sweet spot a little bit up to the toe. If you want to make it a little bit uh, draw bias, you put it a little bit to the heel. You don't want to go extreme, but just enough that when you when you make your swing, now you deliver it just a little more closed, and you get a little bit of that kind of gear, favorable gear effect. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of both. Okay. So, so we try not to go too extreme. Moving the moving the weight on the back of that 410, 
Um, you know, I look at it and it's like, wow, I'm moving this weight, you know, two inches. Um, how much would that move, effectively move that, that point? Yeah, probably less than you think, about a tenth of an inch. A tenth so of does, an inch, okay. It does not take much. It does not. I mean, That's if you think this, this weighs 200 grams, right, and you're taking yeah. just a portion of it and moving yeah. it, right? That's if this true. was a 100 gram weight, you wouldn't have to move it as far. And this is more like a, I don't know, like a 15 gram weight or something like that. So you're taking a small percentage of the club and moving it. Uh, but yeah, that's all you need. Like a tenth of an inch is all we're talking here. And okay. that's 10 yards of ball flight left and right. Wow, that's interesting. And that's a good rule of thumb. A tenth of an inch is about 10 yards of ball flight. Wow. Um, okay, Paul, a, a little bit of a different topic here. I know um, I get to talk to you guys and hang out with you guys uh, not often enough, but fairly often, more often than most. And I know you really are looking almost beyond engineering. How can, yes, how can we design the best club head in golf? But what are golfers doing with that club head and how can we perhaps fit golfers better into the appropriate club head? And how can we give golfers a sense of, well, yes, you're hitting off of a mat on a range in a fitting environment versus going out and playing and how can you do that? And you guys over the last few years, and, and we've spoken about it quite a bit, are working towards coming up with better fitting protocols so that they more closely match what golfers are experiencing and going through and dealing with out on the golf course. And, and so you've, you've started to do some work with the guys at Game Like Training, GLT. And can you tell us a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, I, yeah, well, so, the, so the, I mean, I think you summarized it pretty well. Like, the, as a scientist, you try to, when you try to test things, you try to, like, take out variables. So, like, a robot test is, like, the scientist's dream of you take out all the variables and we just change one thing and we have a very controlled swing and we see what happens, which is great for certain things, but, like, robots don't play golf, humans play golf, right? Yeah. And so on the other end of the scale, to an extent, the ideal golfers thing of knowing if, if what you're doing is working is just watch people play golf and then kind of record what happens and it's a lot messier but it, it's real life right and so the what you're trying to do is control things enough to get good data and know that what we're testing is what we want to test but on the other hand it has to be real golf if you take out too much of the real golf you know what you're testing is is not doesn't translate to the course so sure. And, and, and nowhere is that more apparent than, I think, some of the field clubs. You're putting wedges, I'd say, you know, looking at kind of blade irons, too. We found some of the similar stuff. And so, I, you know, I'm always looking out there for how is there a way we can do this? And when I started chatting to the, the game like training guys, it seemed like that they're trying to do it from the practice side. Of, like you're trying to make your practice more realistic, right? Like more rather than stand there and hit 57 irons in a row, which has its place for skill development and all that. But, you know, putting someone under pressure so that when they're practicing, it's like you get one go at this. You don't get to, if you screw it up, you don't get to have another go and rake it and hit yeah. another. Yeah. It occurred to me that we could apply the same thing in, in testing of trying to set up a more realistic scenario, basically get less data, but make every shot count more. Um, and, and so that's been kind of the, the chat we've had with them, particularly on putters and wedges, is setting up a test. Traditionally, we set up a test that's more, hey, you stick it on a putter robot and do that. Or you say, there's the hole, and you're going to have 10 goes of it, and we're going to see how how successful you are. Right? If, if you make 8 out of 10 of this putt or whatever. But what happens is, I mean, we're all humans and we adapt. Is you give someone enough goes of something, they'll adapt to the equipment and make it work. Yeah, and, and a lot of the differences we might see get washed out because the player, you give someone enough time, they adapt to the equipment. Wedge is a great example too. Of, I can give you, you're a good player. I can give you a wedge that's that's not really suiting your technique, but you adapt your technique to make the wedge work because ultimately, you know, you're not going to stand there and hit bad golf shots all day. You, you hit a couple of bad ones, and then you're like, right, I, no, I want to see this ball get close, and you. You don't even necessarily know you're doing it. Some golfers yeah. do, but a lot of golfers, you don't realize you're, you're adapting to it. So that's been a really fun kind of experiment. And, and, and 
you know, with wedges, we've had some really good success of trying to get closer to the course. Still make it a controlled test so we know exactly what conditions we're testing from. We kind of prescribe it, but you make it much more. Actually, we did one at your course, and it was really kind of fun, right? And yeah, and it, it actually is way more fun than just standing on the range and, and hitting wedges. But ah, uh, yeah. yeah, we have this relationship now with our course where we see, you know, these are the little. If anyone doesn't know, the little sensors on the end of the club that basically track where you go on a golf course, and you can, for the golfer, it's amazing to see. Where do I really go? Where do I really miss? How far do I really hit my club? You know, that's quite enlightening for mm. golfers. For us, when you see it as a totality, of like, okay, here's six million shots. Well, okay, let's look at all the 58 degree wedges that anyone in the world is hitting. Where are they? And it turns out you're way, way, way more likely to be hitting like little chip shots out of the rough than you are full swings out of the fairway. And yet full swings out of the fairway are much easier to test and you get... Yeah. <laughs> So we tended to do more testing on the kind of half to full swings, and then you're looking at the data going, man, 20 to 40 yards is the sweet spot. That, and it's mostly out of the rough. It's not, when you miss greens, you don't miss on the fairway too often. I mean, sometimes. Yeah. But, so the outcast data would suggest you are four times more likely to be out of the rough than out of the fairway when you're hitting wedges. So we set up our little te GLT test, you know, work, um, to hit more out of the rough, maybe a couple out of the fairway, a couple out of the bunker. And what you find is you can see some pretty clear differences between clubs pretty quickly. Um, and it can be really enlightening. And then you can always go into the lab and do a more controlled test of, hey, there's this particular shot that this wedge performs way different to this. Let's go analyze that, which we've sort of done some of. But uh, it, it's been really enlightening that yeah. I think there's a potential that less is more, that you could do a, you could do a wedge fitting for someone with just a few club shots with club a and club b if you just are a bit smarter about how you set those shots up yeah and and i know the the, the very simple straightforward test we did at coach camp in december last year uh really showed differences straight away yeah so it, we had two people go through it and make it a little competition shots. which was really good fun right and but it was it was a world of difference, and, and we didn't really tell people what, what they were testing. It was like, you know, your job is to try to get the ball close to the hole. Let us worry about mm. the other stuff. And, yeah, it was it was really quick and very apparent yeah. uh, without even particularly knowing what you were testing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul, we've got a question here that uh, I want to read to you. It's pretty uh, – I am Golf Insta. Putter question, how much does – Launch angle low or high, and top spin and backspin affect distance control on a putt. If you hit a 15 foot putt, how many inches would the ball come up short? Um, if you had top spin versus backspin, yeah, oh god, it's a really good question. It's a really simple question with a really complicated answer that we've, we've tried to study a lot. Um, there's clearly a big difference in the visuals and and in players' minds on, on backspin versus topspin on a part and how important it is. When you yeah. try to do a test to really study, is it is it be is it fundamentally better to have topspin or backspin? The results are really inconclusive. We actually did some work with the university a few years ago where we really tried to dig into this and, and just show is it fundamentally like most research papers actually start with the premise that getting the ball rolling is definitely better for distance control on putting. Like it just, the ball is more consistent when it's rolling than when it's skipped, which sounds plausible. But, but when you try to test it, it's actually kind of hard to pin down. And what we found was there isn't a ton of difference fundamentally. Like whatever your putting stroke is, if you happen to be someone that gets a fair amount of backspin versus topspin, and you hit like a hundred parts, it doesn't make you more consistent to have top spin. But what it definitely does is it changes rollout. And, and the ball, if you get it rolling quicker, rolls out faster. So more loft on a part, the ball kind of um, tends to roll a little shorter, which depending on who you are and what your miss tendency, it could be, could be better or worse. But there's definitely something there. Um, so I think I, I, it's hard to quantify on a 15-foot part if you hit one with backspin and then one with topspin, the backspin one's going to be the one that probably rolls short. And it's probably, sure. 
a few inches on a 15 foot putt. You know, when you get to a, a 50 foot putt, then it probably becomes feet. Um, but it's not to say that one's better or one's worse. If you're correct, this is what you're accustomed to, isn't it? Yeah, if you're pretty inconsistent, then then that's going to be a problem. Um, it, interestingly, so what we we actually got some when we did this testing with the university, we got some slight indications that maybe like a zero lofted putter would be the most repeatable. And we had a bunch of our engineers go out and build themselves zero lofted putters and then went out to the course to test it. And what they found, and it's a bit anecdotal because it's a hard test to do this one, was different conditions with the zero loft or with less loft, they found that it, it was less repeatable across different conditions. So if you have okay. if you have a 10 foot pot, but one of them's into the grain, one of them's a little uphill, one's downhill, one's the fastest in green, one's the slowest in green, they were finding that with, with no loft, it was harder to adapt to the conditions. So it's quite hard to like prove that's that, test, but um, that seems to be where getting the sweet spot of getting minimal top spin, but not trying to go to the extreme of like, a, you know, a negative lofted butter is maybe a bit more consistent across different conditions. So our fitting philosophy is we fit you to just, just enough loft to kind of get the ball out of any little depression it's in, get like a little bit of launch angle, and you get a pretty consistent roll. So, you know, depending on someone's rise angle will depend on whether that's a little bit of topspin or a little bit of backspin. But consistency is the key. Like getting a consistent... Yeah. But you're going to get more consistent results if you get more consistent initial conditions. Correct. And, and Paul, have you not found that... Um it almost always takes a certain amount of distance. Let's say you've got a 20 foot putt. It almost always takes about five feet for that putt, for that ball to start rolling, whether or not it's top spin or backspin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't just... think it's like a completely set distance. It's usually yeah. kind of a fraction of the putt length. So if it's a 20 foot putt, it probably is like a, it probably is like a four to five. Yeah. It's kind of 20% skidding and then it gets okay. into rolling in reality it's actually a bit more complicated because it kind of goes from like mostly skidding to mostly rolling and it kind of transitions it's not like it suddenly stops skidding and yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and even when it's rolling when you really look in there tight it's actually kind of bouncing and rolling okay. like unless you're playing on true carpet the ball yeah looks like it's rolling but it's actually kind of bouncing so it's a little more complicated than you might think. And the hard thing with putting is, I mean, you think on a driver, we're measuring a ball speed of 150 miles an hour, right? And if we we're off yeah. by a couple of tenths of a mile an hour, it's no big deal. On a putt, you're measuring a speed of like three miles an hour. And you're measuring a spin of 20 RPM. So if you're off by yeah. a few RPM, like that's a big proportion. So it's, yeah, we're, we're, we're asking the measurement devices to do stuff that is really tough. So you have to be a little careful of getting too excited about the numbers sometimes on putting because we're talking yeah. about tiny numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paul, I wanted to ask about this. Um, this is a little deal that you guys have, have uh, kind of integrated into your sleeve, your hosel. And I don't know if everyone can see this, but um, on your, your adjustable woods, which are hybrids, fairways, and drivers, you guys have got a little secret deal. Can you tell me how that came about and and what the thinking was there? You've got this flat setting. Yeah, the, the, the secret settings. Um, the challenge the challenge is always trying to balance uh, features with simplicity, right? So we want it to be simple, but at the end, but you also want to give people features. So <clears throat> the reality is with with the with the hosel, you're basically you're basically tilting the shaft slightly in the head, right? That's yeah. what it does. Yeah. And then you can rotate that to give you different settings. So there's no, you're basically, as you rotate this hosel, you're just, you're going from the shaft being, you know, flat to the shaft being more high loft to the shaft being upright to the shaft being less loft. There's no true zero setting. You're going around the outside of a circle. Gotcha. But explaining to everyone that when you've got eight positions, it's, well, this one changes loft by this much, and lie angle by that much. This one changes lock by this much and lie angle by that. Yeah. We figured that for the mass market it would probably be a little confusing. So we made the story focus on look, 
it's just loft. So what you see on the outside of the hosel is there's a zero setting for loft. Then you've got like a little plus, a big plus, like everyone can figure out what that yeah. means, a little minus and a big minus. And then we just leave the other settings blank, the ones that are kind of around the back side. Yes. In reality, <clears throat> your settings really are most upright, but neutral loft. Then you go around to, you know, more loft, but neutral lie. Then you go around to neutral loft, but flat. And back around to now less loft than neutral lie. So what we did was we put them on the inside that for the folks in the know, for the power fitters, for people who are really into this stuff, it does tell you which settings are the flat ones. But it, for yeah. most people, they can just kind of ignore that and never, never worry yeah. about it. So not trying to treat people as dumb, but just kind of it's a complicated if I could kind of get everyone on Instagram live and give them a five minute video on it, great. But yeah. like, that's not the reality. Yeah. So keep it simple for most people, but it's just a lost story, but you've got this kind of secret settings of the flat ones. And, and to be honest, it's mostly the, the golfers who are really into their games, a lot of the better players, a lot yeah. of who, who want those flat settings. And, and yeah. particularly, I think particularly on the hybrids, that's been really useful. Some people definitely suffer with like, Hybrids going left, and the flat settings help with that. Yeah, um, you know, and that applies to driver and fairway too. But yeah, yeah, it's nice to have those options in the back pocket. Yeah, I, I I'll, I'll always remember one time I was doing a presentation for uh, PGA of Sweden, and there was about 220 pros in the room, and I said, "Can I just take a quick poll of the room? Uh, who in the room struggles with?" Fading or slicing their fairways and hybrids. One person put their hand up. I said, who in the room struggles with hooking their fairways and hybrids? 200 people put their hands up. <laughs> um, it was really amazing. Obviously, you know, most of them are better players, but I see players of every caliber struggle with hooking fairways and hybrids. And I love that new flat setting just because um, it's going to change that face angle and it's going to get that ball to do less of that. Yeah. Very cool. I did see one of the questions was how flat can we go with the driver? So for us, it's three degrees. So from the most upright to the most flat is three degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. Um, Paul, I also wanted to just for a few minutes here, touch uh, on this. You guys have, and you mentioned this, you, you've, uh, affiliated with Arcos, I believe the 710s and the 410 irons, if you buy a set of those, they come standard with Arcos grips in there. Why did you align with Arcos? Because data is great, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really this is like my dream come true. It's like, let's get data on everyone. Um, I, I think, you know, our, our president, John Caso, I'm, um, kind of uh, got into our course a few years ago and kind of came back to us, hey, there's this new thing out there. I really like it. I think it's going to be the future of golf. So we developed a bit of a relationship with them of just, hey, what are you guys doing? Let's test it out. Like we're, we're very much a test first and then, then let's talk kind of company. And, mm. and you know, and then there's, they're not the only people in the world doing something like this, but they do it really well and they've got a commitment to – making the data as good as they possibly can and, and and using it to play your best. I mean, ultimately, that's our company yeah. motto, right, is play your best. Um, with club equipment, it's if this doesn't somehow help you play your best, then it's not part of what we're doing. The Arcos, I think, you know, people understanding what do they really do on the course and how do they use that data to help them play their best is, is some pretty low-hanging fruit. I mean, even amongst our staff, just – yeah even amongst the guys who kind of know what they do, but they've been sort of willingly turning a blind eye to it. And then when you see the data hit you in the face, you're kind of like, yeah, really? <laughs> All right, okay, maybe I don't hit the four iron as well as I think I do. You know, yeah. Whatever that is, um, it, it, you know, so it's, it's huge for the – we just think it's something that is valuable to all golfers, you know, whether, whether it's mm. – you know, whether you're kind of a weekend warrior or tour player. I mean, obviously all tour players – have this with Shotlink. Like that's what yeah. Shotlink does, what Arcos does. It tells you where you're going on the golf course. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, if you're a serious golfer, I think it's almost a must. Like why would you not want to have something like this? And um, 
you, you know, really tell you how far you hit irons, what are you doing in different conditions. For us, I think there could be a big fitting element to it. So if we know what you're doing on the golf course, now you come in for a club fitting, well, based on what you've been doing, it's a lot better than asking you, hey, you're playing a fade right now. You, well, let's see where your misses are. We can really see what we can help you with. Yeah. And then on the other end of it, we just set, we've just fit you for some clubs. Now you go out and use them. Are they working? You know, that's the, the last point of the fitting is, did they do what we thought they would? Yeah. And if not, we've got some changes we could make. We might be able to even recommend, you know, hey, you might want to change your hosel setting. Yeah. You might want to change yeah, your... Yeah. Um, so I think there's an awful lot we can do. Um, like I mentioned before, I have access to all the data now. I've got millions of shots I can look through, and it's, it's fantastic. And you see the, the real populations of what do most golfers do? Where do they miss? What do they, you know, yeah. where can we help them out more? So that's that, why. That's, uh, I mean, that, that data is really so cool. And I know um, as someone who's, I, I've played 11 rounds with my Arcus, uh my arcus um sensors now and it is enlightening if someone were to come to me and say andrew what's the simplest way for me to cut four strokes off my game i'd say get some kind of statistics going that are accurate that are real that are um, have nothing to do with emotion or ego and uh let's see what they have to say and practice based on that practice based off of that you guys are designing clubs based off of that so that's that's really cool uh paul i wanted to ask this what is ping as a company if i may ask what is ping as a company doing to be ready for when we get back to normal oh man uh yeah it's a, such a tough question where if we can even think about that <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, we, you know, I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but, you know, so we're, we've made the decision to kind of like shut things down for April. I mean, it's an easy decision. The Arizona is yeah. pretty well shut down. Um, you know, a lot of the golf industry is pretty well shut down. Um, yeah. So so we're going to spend April um, somewhat in hibernation mode, to be honest. But, but our engineers and our executive team are really working on, yeah, what – what can we do now that will put us in good stead for the summer and beyond? Um, so we're still working on some of our product development, our innovation stuff. It's actually maybe a great opportunity to dream a little bit and collaborate. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of making plans A through about G right now. Of, we don't know. You know, it, it's hard to plan sure. more than about a week ahead. Um, yeah. it's, it seems like forever, but it's, what, three weeks since they were playing the players. Oh my and it seems gosh. like it's you yeah. know it's been the longest march in history, right? But and April is going to be longer. But so we're making never plans be based on for this long. I think you have to assume that it's not just April, right? But May and June is going to be not normal, and, and the whole year is yeah. going to be normal. So, so we're making all sorts of plans of okay, in a not normal world, what does that look like? Do we do a little more engaging with people through things like the internet, through through phone and can we, you know, can we look at how to use technology more on things? It's a lot of brainstorming at the moment. Um, yeah. This is hit ping exactly as hard and as quickly as it's hit everyone else in the world. So, sure. yeah, yeah. So that's my job and my team's job is trying to figure out what, what do we think new normal looks like and how do we be well prepared for that? I mean, I think golf is going to be a great sport. I mean, golf courses are still open in Arizona, which is which is nice. Um, I think as we get back to some sort of normal, golf's a great sport for social distancing. Um, yeah. It is, I, I must say, it is strange playing around the golf or being on a golf course with people and just going, okay, I'm not going to touch you. Uh, it, <laughs> not that, not that you, it's something you think about, but it's like, you know, oftentimes you'll get someone's ball out the hole and flip it to them. And now you just, you just don't do that. Should you even have the ability to play? Well, Paul, I, I wanted to, to certainly make this offer. I am here. I love you guys at Ping. I love what the company stands for. Uh, you guys have helped me out more than I could possibly imagine. If there's anything that I could do to help Ping out in the way of uh, these kind of events or anything, I'm here to help you guys. 
Um, you do, in my estimation, more for uh, golf coaches uh, and more for really the, the interested golfers out there than any other company. And I'm certainly biased when I say that. But uh, I know a lot of people watching and a lot of coaches who have learned a tremendous amount from yourself and Eric, uh, Marty, uh, you know, fantastic job. Thank you so much for all your support of us as golf coaches. And uh, if there's any way we can help out, just shout. Well, I appreciate that, buddy. Um, we're all in this together for the next few months. And so anything, I'm sure I'll be in touch with you. And, and you know, and we're, we're there on hand if there are coaches that, you know, now it probably is a good time to kind of reach out with questions you've got because because myself and some of my team may be able to spend a bit of time answering some of them. So it's, yeah. it's a community thing, right? We're, we're all on it together. So, um, yeah, let's figure out how to make golf stronger through this. And I'm seeing it. I must say, uh, you know, in the, in the golf webosphere, um, whatever that might be, but social media and Facebook and, and Insta and everywhere, I really am seeing some great ideas from golf coaches as they adapt and think outside the box uh, and come up with some good products. Uh, as far as information sharing, it really has been great and the golf community seems to be coming together nicely. So um, thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate the time. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the time with the family and I hope you get a chance to get a little bit of work done. We need you. We need your, <laughs> your expertise. I'll be doing my best. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Take care, Ed. Cheers. Cheers.